1936, Macno had died and Ruti had returned to Spain. Elections took place. Anarchist groups, which presented no candidates, urged their members to vote for the Spanish Popular Front. And with millions of libertarian votes, the left wing won with a tiny minority and a government formed including socialists, Republican Democrats, and a handful of communists. The reaction from the right wing was swift. General Franco ordered all army regiments to take control of the country. Civil war had begun. Franco's coup d'etat came about in 1936, and Spain burst open like a watermelon. On one side was the Progressive Front, and on the other the Fascist Front. And for three years, it was a violent face-off. Like in Italy and in Germany, the upper classes applauded the putsch. Captains of industry provided finance for the fascists, and the Democrats abdicated. The government of the Popular Front, rather than call for resistance, resigned three times in one day. The people were left to their own devices as half of the country fell under Franco's control. Libertarian groups launched an appeal for a general mobilization and suddenly, in all spontaneity, as one, the anarchists answered the call. In Catalonia, led by Duruti, in charge of defending Barcelona, libertarians fended off right-wing forces. To the barricades, the hymn of the CNT, written by Valeriano Orobon Fernandez, a leading anarcho-syndicalist theoretician, in just a few hours became the battle cry of half a nation. Columns formed. Duruti was appointed delegated commander of a militia made up of volunteer freedom fighters. The column, with 3,000 men and women divided into several centuries, named after significant martyrs such as Sacco and Vanzetti, the Duruti column, along with the red and black column, marched on Saragossa, then converged one Aragon to confront the fascist armies. Inspired by the Macnovists, Duruti and his troops fought a war and led a revolution. They forced fascism into a retreat, which later the Republican armies were unable to do. But that was notably in Aragon. And the moment that the Duruti columns liberated a village, they immediately proclaimed libertarian communism. In cada pueblo aragonés, in every liberated village, members of the Duruti column talked to the peasants. The anarchists told them to do away with the hedges separating the fields and to create vast collective zones and to work the land all together. As they advanced, the libertarians chased out masters and gods and declared the end to all privileges. On the squares of liberated villages, lively new dances replaced the old laments. Couples formed in public. Land, work, and bread were shared. The elderly received retirement benefits, and people took time to enjoy life. New practices were invented, and solidarity was renewed. Anarchism deployed its thinking to the extreme. Farmers' assemblies, literacy campaigns. Over 800 Spanish towns and villages declared themselves communes, and one of the greatest collectivist experiments in history had begun. There was an explosion of experiments. Whole towns, not just villages, did away with money. Great. But how would they live? So they invented something that wasn't in the writings of theoreticians, the so-called familial salary, where everybody worked together. But how do you share things? Based on individual effort? No, based on individual needs. They abolished money. It seems unbelievable today, but thousands of people adhered to it and organized themselves around it. Naturally, on these liberated lands, the clergy was expropriated, and the former landowners found themselves working hand-in-hand -hand with the peasants.
la, con la clase trabajadora, ¿no? Things didn't go smoothly everywhere. The anarchists chased out the Guardia Civil and the fascists. But then Franco's troops reconquered the villages, and you can imagine the repression that came after. People mentioned the churches burned down, and the priests killed by the anarchists. It is true. It did happen. When power is seized by the people, it generates acts like that. Revolutionary anarchist Mikhail Bakunin himself said, when revolution comes, it's inevitable that a hundred heads will roll. A hundred heads isn't a lot compared to the horrors committed by the fascists. With almost unlimited material sent by Henry Ford and the support of Italian troops and the infamous German Condor Legion, Franco and his followers launched a campaign of social and ideological cleansing. Like in Seville, where 8,000 people were bayoneted to death. Or at Guernica, where men, women and children were indiscriminately slaughtered by Luftwaffe bombs. Despite widespread fears, the request for arms made by the libertarians to Western democracies went unanswered. The anarchists could, however, count on the international solidarity of the movement which, in newspapers and conferences, appealed for supporters to join the ranks of the insurgents. The Frenchman, Sebastien Faure, anarchist burglar, Maurice Jacob, the Algerian, Mohamed Say, the Argentinian, Diego Abad de Santillan, the Belgian, Louis Mercier Vega, the Russian Georges Sosenko, and political activist Simon Weil, who enrolled in the Duruti column, like Emma Goldman, who at 67 years old, fought in Catalonia. From all around the world, men and women arrived in Spain to support the revolution, and with the first international brigades, the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, made up of mostly IWW members, the Malatesta Battalion, nicknamed the Battalion of Death, and the Louise Michel Battalion from France, foreign revolutionaries, as they arrived, suddenly brought about a change. In their countries of origins, whether they were French, British, American, or Italians or Germans who were in Franco's camps, at no time had they ever encountered an anarchist movement on such a huge scale. George Orwell wrote a wonderful account. In Britain, he frequented not a communist milieu, but a Trotskyite milieu, and he came to Spain to fight. When he arrived in Barcelona, it was a big discovery for him. In Britain, he had no idea that the anarchists existed and even held the city. His account has a slightly odd title, Homage to Catalonia. In theory, it was perfect equality, and even in practice, it was not far from it. There is a sense in which it would be true to say that one was experiencing a foretaste of socialism, by which I mean that the prevailing mental atmosphere was that of socialism. Many of the normal motives of civilized life had simply ceased to exist. The ordinary class division of society had almost disappeared. There was no one there except the peasants and ourselves, and no one owned anyone else as his master. As the international brigades left to reinforce the anarchist columns on the front, to the rear, now aware of the key role the propaganda could play, the libertarians took over the film industry, and with the little money they had, shot newsreels of the fierce battles they were fighting in Aragon. But in this war of images, in which for the first time it was they who were doing the filming, the anarchists made sure to report on the scale and specifics of their revolution as CNT cameramen captured live footage of an insurgent capital. The first report on events in Barcelona was made by the CNT, the Union of Public Spectacle. They went out onto the streets to film what was happening at the barricades. We have some marvelous footage of a city in revolution. We don't have any of St. Petersburg or other places. But here we have footage that tells what a city in revolution is like. These images show a city that is practically anarchist, with an incredible popular enthusiasm that has never been reproduced in our history. These newsreels revealed to the world the scale and coherency of the Spanish libertarian revolution. Amidst the remains of the barricades and the destroyed centers of power, documentary makers such as Félix Marquet captured each step in this great upheaval. Here, anarcho-syndicalism was working at full steam. All forms of bureaucracy, non-productive jobs, and the role of foremen were abolished. 
Major decisions were taken in councils, work was carried out in common, and production means recuperated by the collectivity. In Catalonia, far from the industrial heart of Spain, over 75% of companies were self-managed. Tramways, taxis and buses, hotels and restaurants, bakeries, fishing, foodstuffs, textiles, the leather and shoemaking industry. All these small businesses, like large companies, were now managed collectively with no fall in efficiency or production. The revolution even made inroads into culture which suddenly became popular and social once more. Movies, classical music, opera and cabaret were managed directly by the actors, dancers, musicians, technicians and ushers who were all members of the CNT. Emma Goldwyn, who was 67 when she arrived in Catalonia to support the revolution, wrote, The collectivization of the industries and the land stand out as the greatest achievement of any revolutionary period. Your revolution will destroy forever the idea that the anarchist project means chaos. Moreover, if Franco should win and the Spanish anarchists be exterminated, the work they have started will continue to live. It means that anarchism can work, but on what condition? On the condition that the majority of people believe in libertarian principles. So it's possible to found a society without authority and without government, or with a minimum of authority and a minimum of government. 